Welcome, everybody. Um, my name is Mayo Tarashvili. I'm the Deputy Director of Research here at the Foreign Policy Research Institute. Um, today, we will be talking about the conflict in Nagorno-Karabakh, which uh, broke out, um, which broke out on September 27th, although it's been uh, brewing for a long time. Uh, the death toll at this point has surpassed 500 and a, a significant number of those dead um, are, are civilians. Uh, ceasefire agreement was brokered by Russia on October 10th, but it did not last. Um, each side, both Armenia and Azerbaijan, ha have, has accused the other of violating that ceasefire agreement. So the fighting continues as of right now. Uh, just today, Azerbaijan uh, confirmed that it struck a missile launch site on the territory of Armenia. Um, and this is the first time Baku has officially said that it, it hit a target inside um, the Armenian territory. Um, another significant thing about this conflict is that drones are being used uh, to a greater extent than we've ever seen before. So this is, a, this is an interesting case um, of, of what um, modern warfare and, and perhaps future warfare might look like. Um, we are seeing a very significant involvement from, from Russia. As I mentioned already, Russia was the one who brokered this initial ceasefire agreement. Um, uh, but some, some involvement from, from the European Union, um, especially from some of the member countries, um, mostly silence from, from the, the US side. Uh, it's uh, the, the Kardashians have, <laughs> have gotten involved. We, we saw Kim Kardashian make a video that uh, in support of the Armenian side, in support of the Armenian fund, that video on Instagram has already gotten 17.8 million views. Um, we did see a statement from uh, Joe Biden, uh, Joe Biden's camp finally yesterday, and uh, essentially he called um, he called on on the U.S. government not to delegate diplomacy to Moscow, um, and to he wanted to make clear that Azerbaijan is, should not be seeking military solution to this conflict, um, and. Um, he wanted to tell Turkey and Iran to stay out. We have not seen much on this from the, the White House for right now. Um, we, however, we, we do get a lot of attention uh, when we talk about this conflict. We do get a lot of attention from the FPRI audience and from, from our audiences online. So th this conflict does matter, uh, not just for the Caucasus, not just for the Eurasia region, but for us here as well. Um, today, I am delighted to welcome um, our guests, Dr. Gerard Toll and Dr. John O'Loughlin. Many of you are familiar with their work, whether it's um, their writings on the frozen conflicts in the, in the post-Soviet region or their survey work done there. Uh, so uh, it, it's, a, it's a great honor for me to host them today. Uh, just some housekeeping uh, rules before I turn it over to them so they can make their remarks. Uh, please ask your questions in the Q&A section in writing, and uh, we will turn to those uh, in the second half of this discussion. Um, and we will try to get to as many of your questions as possible. So please feel free to ask as many questions as you'd like. If you have any technical difficulties, that's where you can use the chat box to ask us any questions about your technical difficulties. Um, and uh, I think that's, that's everything for right now. Uh, again, I would like to encourage um, audience participation as much as possible. Uh, so now I will turn it over to Dr. Toll and Dr. O'Loughlin. Okay, well, thank you, Maya, for the invitation to speak. Uh, it's a pleasure to uh, share some of the um, research that we have been doing down the years and our um, experience with this conflict relative to the other uh, so-called frozen conflicts, the never frozen conflicts, their simmering conflicts uh, in the uh, post-Soviet space. And uh, I also think about this conflict too within the context of uh, research that I've done on Bosnia earlier. So let me um, share my screen here um, and talk a little bit about um, 
the conflict, uh, just a very quick um, overview of it within the terms of um, um, critical geopolitics, which is what I use to think through particular conflicts. And so I want to talk about the geopolitical field, in other words, the structure of uh, the conflict and sort of contextualize it within a, a larger a set of dilemmas. Then I'll, I want to talk a little bit about the discourses, the territorial discourses that are used, the contest over the meaning of the territory and space. Um, and then the last I'm not going to say too much about is the really the geopolitical condition, but that's a concern that uh, geographers and um, people working in the geopolitical tradition have had for a long time with uh, spatial revolutions and communications, transportation, military affairs, and what that is doing. And of course, you mentioned that at the outset with the drones. So let's talk first of all a little bit about the geopolitical um, um, field. Um, we are dealing with the legacy of a, a collapsed a communist ideal. Um, this particular uh, poster from 1972 featuring Turkic, Slavic, and Asian brotherhood, very masculinist, uh, a vision of the Soviet Union, but also a very utopian one. Uh, we set ourselves the task of putting an end to ethnic strife and oppression, and we solved it. Well, of course, that was not the case. Um, this conflict, like the conflict in uh, the former Yugoslavia, had their origins in uh, communist federations, uh, legitimacy crises uh, in the 1980s. Uh, so crises at the center of these uh, federations, which were built on anti-democratic to totalitarian foundations, uh, leading to power struggles within the units uh, of these federations, and then leading to tremendous local insecurity uh, as the alternative elite uh, became, uh, realized the power of uh, ethno-nationalist appeals. And so you had a lot of local ethno-territorial entrepreneurship, uh, local leaders seizing the opportunity created by power vacuums at the center and power struggles within uh, unit republics. Um, and uh, as a consequence of that, you had cascades really of insecurity and fear as, as ethno-nationalists seized power. And even though you may not have been an ethno-nationalist, you were forced into taking a side or uh, uh, you were sort of forced to uh, adopt the identities which were fostered by the communist um, uh, system in situations of insecurity. Uh, and when the borders were being questioned, Bolshevik borders, and these were borders which were created by, uh, by a committee uh, on Democratic Committee, which had very little, uh, necessarily li little legitimacy uh, on the ground. Um, when they began to be questioned, then a lot of things were up for grabs and you had a uh, power devolving to the local level and into the hands of militias. And so we can uh, sort of contextualize what happened in uh, Nagorno-Karabakh as really the uh, ways in which the conflict was produced as an ethnicized territorial security dilemma. And then you ended up in a situation in which this small uh, territory became vital to the, the national identity of two post-Soviet states. Uh, and their particular identity is tied up with protecting or rescuing this contested uh, territory. It is a, a volatile symbolic resource for the power structures of both states. It allowed uh, an elite uh, that fought the Karabakh war to take over power uh, in Armenia. Uh, and, um, and then it also allowed the consolidation of uh, authoritarian um, form of governance in Azerbaijan. It brought down a series of governance, uh, governments before you had the uh, the consolidation of power by the Aliyev uh, dynasty. Um, now to turn to a little bit to the um, the discourse and the and the geopolitical culture uh, of the place. Um, I think it's important to to emphasize, and this is one of the things that uh, John and I have written about, uh, and it 
it sort of uh, came to us very much as geographers uh, sort of studying it and getting a sense of, of the place is that there are very different visions uh, in the, uh, on the ground, in the place itself. And these are Armenian visions of the territory. And so I've outlined six different uh, understandings of it. There's the one that everyone sort of refers to and it still appears in our maps, even though it's probably uh, the most obsolete, which is the Soviet uh, NKAO, the particular uh, borders of the uh, entity that was created by uh, the, the Bolsheviks. Um, then you had a different uh, Nagorno-Karabakh Republic declared in 1991, which included territory beyond the, uh, the Soviet NKAO. Then you had the territory which was never claimed, which became part of it in 1994 as a consequence of the, uh, the victory of the uh, Armenian forces on the battlefield. Uh, and so territories, uh, seven provinces beyond the NKO, beyond what was uh, claimed, uh, became uh, initially seen as sort of chips uh, for a negotiation. But uh, by 2006, these uh, had been, been incorporated and the Nagorno-Karabakh Republic uh, defines these territories now as an integral part of Nagorno-Karabakh, which is, of course, like, deeply problematic because this was uh, these were territories which were never uh, initially claimed and uh, which weren't contested, but they were places where the uh, the Karabakh army had driven the population out in rather brutal form and had destroyed cities such as Agdam. Um, I mentioned also Artsakh, which is a sort of local understanding of uh, Nagorno-Karabakh, which uh, sort of grounds it back in the uh, history of Armenia. So there's a sense that th this is a return to uh, a territory which was uh, primordially, uh, originally uh, Armenian. But then there's a last sense, which is somewhat different from this uh, historical sense, and that is the idea that this is sacred Armenian ground. And here there's the emphasis on uh, uh, churches, there's an emphasis on uh, uh, tombstones, and there's the sort of search for artifacts and the uh, Tigrana Kurt is, is part of that whole emphasis on it. And it's a way of sort of reconceptualizing ground which was ethnically cleansed or for, uh, uh, where you had forced displacement uh, as being somehow a uh, sacred Armenian ground. Uh, Lawrence Brewers and I have written about this sort of enlarged sense of a uh, uh, Karabakh and the maps that have been produced by this. And so uh, you can see some examples of that. Interestingly, this particular map uh, is on the one hand making this kind of grand claim to all of these other territories. While in the corner, uh, you can see that the actual, uh, the um, more uh, official international um, um, set of, um, uh, cartography is also acknowledged. So there's two kind of cartographies uh, at work here. Um, and uh, anyone who goes to uh, Artsakh will, uh, of course, be aware that it's very much coded as a tourist space for Armenian diaspora. Uh, and it's coded in terms of its uh, particular um, uh, religious sites. On the other hand, uh, you have in Azerbaijan, uh, a sense that this is a territory which uh, is legally part of Azerbaijan. This is territory that uh, was uh, um, uh, occupied, is occupied uh, by the, um, uh, it has to be liberated. Sense that it is
tries to get give some in this conflict. Uh, and uh, what is, I think, significant about the current fighting is that the fighting is now into the uh, NKAO, and uh, I'm sure people have followed the uh, conflict over this particular town here of Hadrut, uh, which is within the NKAO, and that there is, is really quite significant. So it's not simply Azerbaijan, quote unquote, liberating the uh, territories of the seven provinces, it's actually uh, 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 an attack on the NKAO and on the original Karabakh itself. Now, um, this um, particular slide is not going to make me popular, but I think uh, it is uh, one that I, um, I need to share and sort of uh, it is one that I would share with my students in order to try to uh, um, bring out the fact that both of these territorial discourses, the Azerbaijani emphasis on territorial integrity and the Armenian emphasis on it being sacred, uh, ancient, existential territory of Armenia, both of these are utopian discourses. They are uh, visions of pure ownership uh, and they, they are violent. They justify forced displacement and really uh, in certain ways they are warrants for, for what are war crimes. Uh, I, I hate to say that, but of course th this is something that we have to debate and talk about. Uh, and, and they're also cruel. They ignore the legitimate claims of others um, to, uh, to return to their homes, uh, to uh, have justice uh, for the injustices that they have suffered. Uh, they ignore the human security needs of the living. Um, and so then the last is the, the whole issue of um, the ways in which the conflict has uh, as a whole space, has, has a new dimension as a consequence of uh, spatial, um, new spatial technologies, revolutions in spatial technologies. There is a spectator sport militarism uh, at work here, uh, and we need to talk about that and the implications of that. I think one of the things that's sad about this conflict is that the cartographic dimension of it, the emphasis on the visual, the emphasis on um, the sort of idea of liberating um, places that we can uh, look at on the map con is, is really in, in conflict with the real, which is the lived lives of ordinary people uh, in these places. And uh, too much, uh, there's too much of an emphasis uh, on the cartographic. And I think that as a consequence of that, the lives of real human beings are being left behind here. Humans, human beings that are suffering uh, within uh, Karabakh right now, but also we have to remember the, those that have been displaced uh, and, um, and deserve justice too. So with that, I'll, I'll stop. So we can turn it over to Dr. Lachlan before we go into Q&A. Okay, uh, <clears throat> thank you, Maya. And just to echo Jared's comments about uh, the um, lives of ordinary people, I will focus on that and talk about our work, uh, first of all, a bit more generally, and then specifically what we see in Karabakh. Um, the background, of course, uh, is, to the, to the conflict um, is often overlooked. People tend to focus on what's going on on a daily basis, even an hourly basis. But as Jared um, very carefully and very hopefully laid out the, um, the geographic, the cartographic, the, um, the claims uh, of various groups, um, it's worth keeping those in mind as we um, talk about the current conflict. Uh, what I will start off with here is a general map of the region. Maya had asked me to briefly talk about our work uh, in the general sense, and I'll just do that in, in a minute or two. But um, this map uh, shows the contested regions of the Black Sea Caucasus area, um, the so-called four de facto's, uh, Transnistria, Abkhazia, South Ossetia, and Karabakh in the bottom right here. But of course, uh, in the last decade, we can add two more areas to that, um, Crimea now annexed to Russia from Ukraine, and then of course, the People's Republics of Luhansk and Donetsk in um, Eastern Ukraine. Um, and our work um, is really focused 
on the lives of ordinary people, their beliefs, their fears, their attitudes. And it's done through um, large scale um, surveys. And uh, what I wanted to show you uh, here was um, the three waves of surveys we've done in this area around um, these kinds of questions that Jared was just elaborating. Um, it's funded by the National Science Foundation continuously, for which we're of course very grateful. Um, it is a um, academic or pure a science project. There is no kind of policy um, advocacy here. And, um, you know, we're trying to really understand uh, beliefs and on the ground, so to speak. Um, the current project is the largest. It's funded by both um, the U.S. National Science Foundation as well as the British uh, Research Council. And then we have also some money from the German uh, Center for um, Eastern European and International Studies. And the work we've done is basically three waves. Uh, the first one about a decade ago in the four de facto states, Abkhazia, South Ossetia, Transnistria, and Karabakh. And then in 2014, after the annexation of Ukraine at the time of the war that broke out in the Donbass, we added in surveys in Crimea and uh, across Southeast Ukraine. Um, and then this current project is even more ambitious. It has these four de factos, it has Crimea, um, it has the Donbass as a specific area, both sides of the line of control, um, but also it has large uh, public opinion surveys across six um, former Soviet uh, republics, uh, now independent countries, Georgia, Armenia, Kazakhstan, Ukraine, Belarus, and Moldova. So we're, we're talking here now of uh, a total number of respondents above 12,000. So large, large numbers of people that are uh, questioned um, in these surveys. The one thing you'll notice on that list of countries is that's missing is Azerbaijan. And i just take a moment here to tell you why it's missing. Um, we insist that uh, when we do surveys, that they are independent surveys, that there is no government involvement, that there is no government control, that there is no government um, oversight. And uh, unfortunately, we couldn't do that in Azerbaijan. We tried very hard, uh, lots of letters back and forth with the presidential administration, lots of contacts. We translated the survey into um, Azerbaijani. Uh, we really tried, but um, because the government wouldn't allow or guarantee this lack of uh, uh, oversight, uh, we just didn't go ahead with it. So that's why uh, when we report results from Armenia and Karabakh, uh, those were two places where we could do this kind of independent work. Um, <clears throat> so I wanted to uh, follow up on a point that Jared just made. Um, and it's a comment that we often get on our work. Um, and it has to do with displacement and who is living uh, in these um, republics now. So here are the four republics. And I have uh, made a kind of a quick graph to show you the approximate distribution of population before the war and the situation now. And Transnistria essentially didn't change. There was no mass displacement as there was in the three other uh, republics. But if you look, for example, at South Ossetia, uh, which had a large uh, Georgian minority um, before uh, 2008, um, before 92, uh, now, of course, it's uh, about 90% Ossetian and a Georgian population around 10%. Um, so again, large displacement, uh, forced displacement of Georgians in South Ossetia. The same thing in Abkhazia, uh, where the ratios change significantly um, because of the events of the early 90s. And again, now the Georgian population, which was about half of the total, is now a, a minority. And in Karabakh, it's the most complete uh, displacement of all um, of all these areas where, um, again, a significant Azerbaijani minority uh, is now absent completely with, because of displacement and the population is now um, close to 100% um, Armenian Karabakh. So when we survey, we obviously survey people who are currently resident in the area and we um, sometimes capture the um, the displaced populations in the national surveys on the other side of the line. But it's worth emphasizing again uh, that we are only looking at current residents, not former residents. 
um, again, uh, Jared showed you this map, so I'll skip through it quickly. But um, I guess the reason why I would come back to this map again and again has to do with the conception of what is Karabakh? Where is Karabakh? What are its borders? What are, what are the claims? And um, again, you know, because there are multiple versions of Karabakh, as Jared just showed you, um, I will refer to this map uh, when we get to some of the survey results. Um, so this um, is a graph um, that we published a couple of years ago, and it has to do with the conception of Karabakh. Again, because these are large samples, you know, we're talking uh, 800 uh, to 1,000, and, and for large countries like Ukraine, uh, more than 2,200 people, um, it's, it's very hard to um, ask complicated questions in a manner that is both direct and uh, we can get a clear answer about it. So we have to give kind of a series of options. And that's what we did with this question about the Karabakh uh, territory. What is the um, geographic definition of Karabakh? And <clears throat> if we just look at the bars here, if you kind of combine the category, strongly agree and agree those two categories. Where is Karabakh? What is the territorial boundaries of Karabakh? You'll see that, and let's leave Artsakh aside for a second, because that's, again, a little bit different. Um, you can see very few people believe that it corresponds to the old Soviet autonomous region, right? It's a tiny proportion, about 12% agree with that. Most people disagree with that conception. And then if you add the area north of the autonomous area, Xiaomian, you can see, again, most people don't think that's enough, right? They disagree with that. And then if you say, well, it's uh, the current area that the Republic of Karabakh controls, the numbers go up, but it's still a mi minority, right? And as the territorial uh, definition expands, more and more people agree with it. So if you say the area that's currently controlled, but the areas of the NKAO that are under Az Azerbaijan control, then you can get a majority who now agree with that conception. And then going to Jared's point about um, the historic area, the, the claim that there is a kind of a Armenian um, cultural legacy across the region marked by churches and religious sites and other archeological remains, uh, that actually gets the highest level of support, right? So what this shows you is that in Karabakh, the residents there now have a kind of a maximalist sense of where the territory is. <clears throat> we followed that up, that survey was done in uh, 2011. We followed it up with two questions more recently. Uh, this was done in February of this year, before the election in Karabakh, and also um, obviously before the, uh, the conflict in, in July and then more recently. And <clears throat> again, you can see that uh, the NKA on, only as, a, as the the territorial boundary of Karabakh has very, very little support, right? The, the, the green bars here. Um, and vast numbers, the vast majority disagree that Karabakh is only the NKAO. Um, but if we say <clears throat> it's the lands with Armenian churches and um, the kind of historic definition, then you can see that in fact, the vast majority agree with that conception. So again, you know, what we found in 2011 is repeated in 2020, right? This, this idea that the NKAO is much too small for modern Karabakh and that in fact, there's a much larger territorial claim. Um, <clears throat> and then one of the um, key elements about the current the conflict and, and the more broader kind of uh, geopolitical question, if we go from Karabakh and sort of start going out and up in a, um, in a geographic uh, scale. Uh, this question about unification between Armenia and uh, Karabakh, uh, what we found in the earlier surveys um, is that there is a really mixed opinion in Karabakh about it. In 2011 and again in 2013, it was about half and half uh, in terms of the support for unification with Armenia and independence. Um, for Karabakh, in other words, not unified with Armenia. That became front and center very recently when uh, Nicole Pashinyan asked uh, or said um, that 
the two units should be combined, should be unified. And so we asked the question, was um, Pasha Mignan uh, right? Do you support his call for unification? And here I'm comparing the Karabakh results in blue with the Armenian results in red. And you can see that in Armenia, right, if you add the 51% here and the 26, 27% here, you can see about three quarters of Armenians agree with Pashinyan's call, right? Again, same question exactly in both Karabakh and in Armenia. In Karabakh, however, there is really a mixed opinion about Pashinyan's call for unification. Uh, again, a majority disagree with it. Um, a, a large minority uh, agree with it. So um, there is um, some separation, some gap, uh, some distance between public opinion in Armenia and in Karabakh on this uh, key question. And um, again, it often appears um, in the discussions about Armenia and Karabakh, because obviously the armies are fighting together, um, that there is no significant uh, difference of opinion between the two units. But in fact, in terms of public opinion, there, there actually is. Um, and again, going kind of more broadly uh, out, out a bit and looking at the role of Russia and kind of the opinions of people in the area about Russia, um, I just want to show you some, <clears throat> some graphs again that show uh, a very strong uh, orientation, positive orientation to Russia. Um, these graphs are from an article we just published a couple of days ago. Um, but again, <clears throat> if we ask uh, people in Karabakh on an east-west scale, right, so zero point is the west and 10 is Russia, right, so there's <clears throat> 11 points along the scale here. Um, and then we ask them where Karabakh is currently and where Karabakh should be, right? In other words, where they think it is right now and their preference for where, where it should be. A couple of things really stand out. First of all, most people believe it's more oriented towards Russia than it is to the West. And then where it should be, in fact, it's even more people want it oriented towards Russia than to the West. And again, this was done in February. Um, it's not obviously taken into account how opinions might have changed as a result of the current conflict. But again, it shows the um, strong and positive orientation uh, to Russia. Um, and then, you know, we have this scale uh, that we ask in all of these places I mentioned earlier in these 12 um, different political units across the former Soviet Union about the extent of their relations with Russia, what they could support and um, what they find to be too close. Um, in Georgia and Ukraine, you can imagine the the graphs are very, very different than they are in Armenia and Kazakhstan and, and Belarus. But um, here you can see, you know, 90% both in Armenia and in Karabakh want uh, good and positive relations with Russia, not surprising. Again, close to 90% or more than 80% want military cooperation with, with Russia. But then things fall apart a bit. Uh, and this is where the gap and the separation comes between Armenia and Karabakh. You can see in Armenia, again, 70% want to allow Russian troops and bases in the country. And there's already, of course, a Russian base in Gimri in, uh, in Western Armenia. Um, but by contrast, in Karabakh, the ratio is less than half. It's just uh, slightly under 50% want uh, Russian troops and bases. And again, this has implications for any discussion about Russian peacekeepers or extending the, um, the zone of uh, presence of Russia beyond Armenia to Karabakh. But before the conflict, uh, less than half uh, supported that idea. And then lastly, um, you know, when we ask about uh, Vladimir Putin, um, the uh, figures again show a, a significant difference between Armenia and Karabakh. Um, if you look at the no trust at all in Putin, again, Karabakh is much higher than, sorry, uh, Armenia is much higher than uh, Karabakh. But then if you go to this category here about trust a lot, you can see that the Karabakh uh, figures for trust a little, trust a lot um, combined uh, show a majority of people have a lot of uh, our trust uh, Vladimir Putin. Um, so I'll stop there and uh, 
obviously we're happy to engage in a discussion and, and answer any questions, but we have a lot more detailed information on both uh, Armenian Karabakh uh, across a wide, wide range of questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. This this data is really fascinating and informative. Um, I keep getting uh, a few questions about, you know, what about the Azeri opinion? Have you asked Azerbaijani refugees what they think of this? Um, maybe maybe that point was not clear to some people that you were unable to carry out um, this survey work in Azerbaijan because you did not have the guarantee that it would be independent of any kind of government in, um, interruption. But maybe um, through other through through your other work, maybe you do have a sense of what the opinion is in Azerbaijan about Nagorno-Karabakh um, and, you know, who should have, um, no, who should well, be in control of it. You know, this is where, you know, prejudice rushes in where data is not uh, existent. Uh, and I'm, I, we would really like to know and I uh, would like to be able to conduct a uh, research in Azerbaijan and um, there is capability uh, within Azerbaijan and we work with uh, CRRC uh, Azerbaijan. Uh, they're very capable. They've done uh, other uh, work which they were able to negotiate uh, um, which was not political um, and uh, unfortunately you cannot do political uh, work there um, and you know it does tell us something that you can't uh, that there's no trust um, in uh, researchers and uh, doing work without hindrance and that is there may fear what uh, will be found. And in that respect, uh, Armenia and Karabakh are to be commended for having more open societies, which are not afraid of the plurality of views. Uh, one would expect that there are hardline uh, views there, but um, you know, there also may be a diversity of opinion uh, too. And um, the particular uh, situation with um, internally displaced people within Azerbaijan uh, is a very contentious one. Uh, the World Bank has done some research on that. There's a lot of poverty. Uh, there's a lot of uh, social isolation, non-integration uh, of uh, displaced uh, persons. And that in and of itself uh, would be uh, something that, that researchers could really uh, do a lot of work on and help with but we don't have that uh, 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 possibility uh, because of the decisions made by the government. Um, I also want to delve a little bit more into Russia's role here. So in my opening remarks, I, jo I, I jokingly mentioned how the Kardashians have come out in, in support of Armenia. That's just to highlight how little how little we are seeing from the United States in this conflict. And historically, I think more than some of the other frozen conflicts in the region, the, the West has kind of left this one mostly to Russia, and it's been kind of like Russia's headache, if you will. Um, but maybe we can talk a little bit more about the, this uh, potential of maybe having Russian peacekeeping forces there, and also just more widely how positively Russia's role is perceived um, overall in Armenia and Azerbaijan in Nagorno-Karabakh, especially compared to in Georgia and Moldova in, in the other conflict zones. There, Russia seems to be, you know, simply speaking, the villain. Um, but the situation is very different here. So let's delve a little bit more into that because I think it would be important for our audience to understand that difference. Mm -hmm. Okay, I can take the first stab at it, and I'm sure Jared will uh, pile on. Um, that, that scale I showed of um, West versus Russia, um, we have used extensively. It's called a Gutman scale. And the idea is that an individual respondent can say, yes, I agree with this. Uh, yes, I agree with this. No, that's too much. Right? And they kind of jump off the scale. And it's a really good way of summarizing uh, national opinion about where they think the country is and where they think the country should be. And just following up and extending what Maya just said, uh, what we find as 
is that in, um, in Georgia and Ukraine uh, are one set of countries, right? They, they really stand out as being strongly pro-West. Then you have the strongly pro-Russian set, which includes Armenia, Kazakhstan, and Belarus, right? That might be changing because we did this before, you know, all events uh, happened in Belarus this summer. Um, and then Moldova is somewhere in the middle, right, between these two. So we have three, uh, actually four units, um, Belarus, Kazakhstan, Armenia, Karabakh, strongly supportive of Russia, believe that their country should move even more towards Russia, right? And then on the other side, Ukraine and Georgia, um, and then Moldova, sort of in the middle. Um, and I think um, you're right. I mean, it's, it's, it, it's not, um, it's unusual when you compare it to the situation in Georgia, right? The, the kind of strongly pro-Russian orientation. Um, obviously, Russia has been there from the beginning, um, one of the co-chairs of the Minsk group. Um, there is a, a Russian military presence in the region, in Armenia. There is a, um, an, a treaty and agreement, a, a security agreement with Armenia. Um, and, but again, Russia has tries to maintain and I think has good, relatively good relations with Azerbaijan. So it, it's a very um, difficult position actually for Russia to be in right now. On the one hand, it has a security treaty and an agreement uh, with Armenia. But on the other hand, it tries to keep Azerbaijan on side to, to use the soccer term. Um, and, but in general, people in Armenia and in Karabakh look to Russia uh, in a way that they don't think of the US. Um, in, in the US is a very distant place, except maybe for the Kardashians, as you said. Um, it, we, we asked the question about Donald Trump, the same question we asked about Vladimir Putin. I could show the results if you're interested, but um, it's not- it last is, you know, to see the, <laughs> the numbers are so small. Yeah, 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 well, um, I, well, just now that we talk about it, maybe I should show it. Um, yes, I think we should, yes. Yeah, if I just want to share the screen here quickly. <clears throat> Okay, so there are the figures for Donald Trump um, asked again in this figure. You can see no trust at all is above 50% uh, in both places. There's a little trust um, and then a very small ratio of trust a and lot. There's a lot of people. This was February, correct? Yes, this was done in February. <clears throat> um, and so, you know, again, it's the kind of opposite of the graph for Putin, which has the bars, you know, going the other way, uh, low on the left and high on the, uh, on the right. Um, so I think, um, you know, Russia is in a sense, uh, very um, well positioned in a way uh, to maintain this kind of popular support, popular trust um, of the Russian government that may change depending on events um, that have a life of their own uh, in the war, but at least the um, contextual background is, is very favorable. Yeah, just on, um, on your initial point, Maya, about the US uh, absence, I mean, I think one of the tragedies of the disaster that is the uh, Trump presidency in foreign policy terms uh, is that um, the U.S. had some really very capable uh, negotiators uh, as part of the Minsk process. And this was one particular arena where the United States and Russia could collaborate uh, and did collaborate in the past uh, to try to push the parties forward. Russia is not behind this uh, particular conflict. And uh, while some will argue, and it is true that Russia, the Russian arms industry benefits from the conflict, but Russian diplomacy uh, and Russian foreign relations generally do not, because this puts them in a very, very difficult situation with large uh, diasporas uh, from both uh, Azerbaijan and uh, Armenia within uh, Russia. Um, and, you know, it is said of Lavrov that he always has in a secret drawer a peace plan for uh, Karabakh. And so the, one of the tragedies is that 
that um, sort of history of um, high level cooperative diplomacy, multilateral diplomacy, which brought the US and Russia together, that, that's been lost. You know, the current uh, US Minsk uh, a negotiator, uh, um, group negotiator, it doesn't have uh, ambassadorial status. Uh, and so that in and of itself tells you, uh, tells you something. Uh, so that's the one tragedy. Secondly, I think it's important to emphasize that this was one place where the United States could realize that sort of reflexively following the doctrine of territorial integrity and saying territorial integrity always and echoing the, uh, the Georgian government, now the Ukrainian government on territorial integrity. And um, this is one place where it was balanced by a recognition that there needed to be uh, acknowledgement that there, there, there also has to be self-determination or a consideration of the fact that people on the ground uh, present uh, um, a situation which shows the limits of this uh, doctrine of territorial integrity. You know, it is sad but, and it, it is wrong, but the, 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 the sort of the, the dogmatic use of territorial integrity can be a warrant for what, is, what are war crimes. And that, that is really, really wrong. And so therefore, this is one place where I think we can learn about the fact that these are contested places and those contested places need to be in a separate space in which the, uh, one would hope that the US and Russia could uh, cooperate. This is one place where they could, but obviously they haven't over uh, Crimea for obvious reasons and uh, over uh, Georgia. Uh, and then Moldova is a sort of a different situation. Um, but um, the, the, I think that there is uh, a lost opportunity and that's part of the tragedy uh, of the situation. I think, I think your take on, on this is fascinating, the, the issue of territorial integrity versus self-determination. And once you introduce the notion of occupation, it sure. becomes even more complicated because you also introduce a, a lot of legal issues, right? If you, if you say a place is occupied, then you cannot engage with anyone who lives there. So you entirely dismiss the, the, the population within, within that occupied territory because you are saying you will only speak to the occupant. And we know, we know how that has gone in the case of yeah, and, yeah, Russia. Yeah, and again, that is a, another warrant for war crimes because you end up saying, well, we can target occupiers when those occupiers are actually people who have lived there for, you know, for generations uh, and have a right to be heard, just as the displaced persons have a right to justice and have a right to have their particular experience uh, acknowledged uh, and have uh, a peace process which will allow them to have some degree of, uh, of restitution. Uh, if not return. And, uh, you know, that's, this is the, the tragedy of it, uh, of the situation. And often they, when governments get uh, talk that legal language, uh, they, what is lost is the fact that that legal language can be enabling positions which are cruel uh, and uh, which are uh, uh, in actual fact to those governments counterproductive. Because who is going to uh, believe a government that says, you're our citizens, but you're occupiers and, you know, and wage war against them? I mean, this is uh, something that uh, I, unfortunately is, we're seeing right now. Uh, on the one hand, the Azerbaijani government is saying, you're our fellow citizens, there's a place for you within uh, Azerbaijan. But on the other hand, there are shells coming down uh, on the religious sites of the, uh, of the Armenians living there and on their homes and terrorizing them. And so they're, uh, you know, this is, they're just further traumatized and further uh, alienated from uh, what is supposed to be their parent uh, state. Correct. So and Maya, I, can I just follow up on that? Um, one of the questions we ask in all of these places 
uh, and we've asked it now in, in you know, more than a dozen surveys uh, across the various um, de facto states, is uh, since 1991, which is the end of the Soviet Union, have you or your family members um, been displaced um, or uh, seen violence or affected by violence? Um, and you know, because these are small places uh, and because the conflicts were so all-encompassing um, in Abkhazia, in South Ossetia, in Karabakh, not, not so much in Transnistria. Transnistria is a very different uh, situation. Um, the over half, you know, well over half of the respondents say yes to that question. So, you know, it's not like a lot of conflicts which tend to be in, you know, middle or large countries confined to a small area, right? So the, for example, the Chechen war uh, in the 90s was obviously, apart from uh, a couple of incidences in Moscow and elsewhere, uh, was really confined to a small part of this enormous Russian landmass. You know, here in these small territories, everybody just about uh, is affected by the conflict at that particular time. And, you know, as Jared said, the legacy of that um, trauma that people go through um, is, is really um, reflected in the opinions about the uh, groups that inflicted the trauma on them. You know? So um, in the earlier surveys that we did in the early um, 2010s in Karabakh, you know, the, the attitudes, the um, trust in Azerbaijanis, it's, it's, it's zero. I mean, it's absolutely no sense that there is any kind of accommodation with uh, the Azerbaijan government as a result of the events of the early 90s. So then you add in the war, uh, the short war, four day war of 2016, and then you add in the current conflict. It's just in a sense, cumulating trauma and distrust and uh, hostility. And uh, frankly, it makes me more and more pessimistic about any kind of accommodation between the two groups. Yeah, and we, we saw that with South Ossetia as well. Uh, we saw that with uh, uh, Abkhazia too, is the 2008 war was, um, you know, just shattered any trust that uh, was potentially there and uh, it was a tremendous setback for the possibility of uh, there being uh, some sort of process of uh, reconciliation. Um, and Another thing that makes this conflict unique from the other frozen conflicts is that there is there's another major player in, in form of Turkey. Um, I actually have a question from our director of research, Aaron Stein. Did any of your research touch on the role of Turkey? I assume Ankara is viewed quite neg negatively, but want to hear your views about the potential responses to a different external actor um, enmeshed in the current conflict. I, I can... Um... I can answer that. Um, one of the questions we asked uh, in, uh, actually two questions we asked in this current survey across uh, these 12 units was, um, who is our country's greatest friend and who is our country's greatest enemy? <laughs> Open question. And um, you can pretty much anticipate what the answer was. Um, in terms of uh, who is the greatest friend, it's Russia, you know, far and away. Uh, I could pull up the um, results here in a second if people are interested in the, in the details. And then who is the greatest enemy? It's Azerbaijan, you know, far and away, and then Turkey comes in second, right? But it's, it's not, at least it wasn't evident in February, you know, uh, the prominent role of Turkey, uh, but it is mentioned as the kind of second enemy, shall we say, of uh, Karabakh and Armenia. But it's Azerbaijan, you know, way, way ahead uh, as the first enemy. Yeah. Very interesting. I, I have, um, we're getting so many questions and I'm, uh, I'm sorry that we're running out of time, but I do want to ask this one question because that is interesting and it does merit clarification about in your survey, you know, Armenians, um, the opinion of, of the Armenians versus the Armenians who live in Karabakh. And this person is asking, you know, are you saying there are two different people? You know, is there a different ethnicity of Karabakhian, right? Because they're, this person says they're just Armenians, right? So maybe you could explain that, you know, why, why you have these opinions separated, right? It's not because they're not all Armenian. It's because of where they live. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, that's, a, that's exactly right. Uh, we're not saying that they are different people at all. I mean, there are uh, some differences, frankly, um, that show up um, between the two groups. Uh, we did ask questions, for example, about who is responsible for the four-day war. Um, this is the war of 2016. And in Armenia, um, the blame for Azerbaijan is actually much less than it was in Karabakh. Um, and, and so you, you see these kinds of differences. And I think it's, um, you know, maybe, maybe this war will change things um, and in a sense, produce a greater sense of uh, solidarity and unity between the two populations. But I think in normal times or well, hopefully normal times, uh, not, not conflict times, um, you know, these are in fact two uh, independent uh, political entities in a sense. I mean, obviously they, they are closely linked, but they have their own dynamics and their own kind of separate uh, worlds. Um, they come together, obviously, uh, during conflict times. And, um, but we do, you know, we do see with the same questions, some serious differences between the populations. I think it's partly a result of the um, political circumstances in Azerbaijan uh, with the arrival of uh, Pashinyan, <clears throat> A couple of years ago to power, and that really changed uh, the situation relative to Karabakh. And I think uh, th those developments in our media are reflected in the differences between the two places. Yeah, we're geographers, and place matters, uh, and where you're socialized, and uh, what you, what particular flag you salute, and all of those things, uh, that is accumulation of uh, on your identity. So you're sort of the term we use spatial socialization and social spatialization uh, without getting uh, you know, too academic about it. But uh, we're not saying they're, therefore there are two different people. We're just saying that these are uh, particular uh, places uh, which, have, um, which are inevitably structured by where they're located and inevitably structured by the particular entities uh, and de facto, though it is, and unrecognized though it is, it's nevertheless on the ground um, something that has legitimacy amongst the population within Karabakh, uh, the, the current resident population within Karabakh. Thank you. Um, I have another question about another important external actor, and that's France. Um, can you elaborate on the level of trust in Armenia and Nagorno-Karabakh towards President Macron and France generally? Um, basically, no. Um, <laughs> one of the uh, questions we had um, was, again, asked everywhere because we do both, um, sorry, I, maybe I should have explained this earlier. Uh, we try and ask the same questions <clears throat> everywhere. And then we have, in addition to the common questions, we have specific questions in individual places reflecting local circumstances, right? So the question about the four day war was asked in Armenia and Karabakh, but obviously not in Ukraine or Belarus. Um, so one of the questions we asked, <clears throat> and it's a really interesting one, uh, was which power has the greatest status? And there are four options, actually five options. So, um, Russia, the US, EU, China, and then don't know, right? Mm -hmm. And what was surprising to me anyway, is the um, lack of prominence of the EU uh, throughout our survey regions, um, and also in both Armenia and Karabakh. So, you know, in, in, um, in Armenia and Karabakh, Russia is far and away, you know, the number one greatest power, and then the US, and then China, and then the EU is, is barely visible. Only you know five seven percent of people pick that as the the, 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 the greatest status. Um, you know, obviously in Ukraine it's it's, it's higher. China's lower, and, and the EU is higher in Ukraine. Um, but you know, asking this question about Macron and about France um, is that you know the EU is not perceived in the same way as the US and Russia. Um, I think it's viewed more as a kind of an economic um, unit, an economic entity, and not a great power in the sense of a military and a kind of a security superpower like the US and, and Russia. But, but I would just add that the uh, European Union and France was not a focus of our, our research, so we're sort of telling you 
where it sort of came up. Um, so we, we really cannot say uh, in, in any depth. And so someone could conduct uh, surveys on the European Union and on France and, you know, be able to answer those questions in a much more precise way. There are just certain things that we, we cannot um, tell you because we just are not able to get a clear sense of it from what we have gathered in this, in this particular uh, survey or the uh, sets of surveys. And remember, these are imperfect too, you know, and the, the situation has changed. And so what people believe now is not necessarily going to be what they believed in February, especially after a traumatic event like a war. So there are lots of things that are up in the air at the moment. Yeah. I even had a question about, you know, how do you think the pandemic sort of the, the quarantine, the, the lockdowns, how do you think that may have affected, right? What, what happened and, and even what people think of um, the external actors now. So yes, I, I absolutely. I think that makes a lot of sense. I, I, unfortunately we are out of time and we had, we got, we, we received so many great questions. I think throughout your remarks, you, you did end up answering a lot of these questions. Um, I would like to thank you both for, for joining us, uh, for, for taking the time to share your work with us. Uh, we are going to continue keeping an eye on this conflict. And um, again, I, I'm going to continue to, to say, I'm, I'm hoping next time we speak about this, there will be a ceasefire in place. Um, uh, on Monday, uh, I will be joined by a couple of my colleagues. We'll talk about the unrest in Kyrgyzstan. And the following Monday, the 26th, I will be joined by a couple of my colleagues who, are look, who look at Georgia and we'll be talking about Georgia's domestic political process and security issues, obviously, as we go into the parliamentary elections uh, at the end of October. So um, all of this is, I think, still quite relevant to this region. Um, thank you both. Thank you to our audience members. And uh, please keep an eye on our website, fpra.org, for more coverage of, of this region. Okay. okay, thank you, Maya. Great, thank you, Maya. Okay.